Are humans becoming worthless? Is your job pointless? Does what you do have any impact upon the world? According to surveys conducted in the UK and America, between a quarter and a third of people believe that what they do for a living makes no meaningful contribution to society. And with automation seemingly on the verge of replacing almost every job on the planet, it is appropriate to ask whether most jobs need to be done by humans at all. Will work soon be considered a relic of a bygone age? Are machines here to save us from the chore of daily effort? And if so, what is our purpose? What will give our lives meaning? Are humans on the verge of becoming worthless? The Pointless Professions If you are Paul Pogba or Alexis Sanchez, your job is almost certainly pointless. Because if you replace them in Man United's midfield with one of those toy birds that drinks water, nobody would notice the difference. But what about the rest of us? Do we all have a pointless job to some degree? Are many of us working for working sake? David Graeber explores this phenomenon in his book, Bulls Jobs where he discusses how technology, which should have freed us from unnecessary work, has actually led to the creation of tasks, jobs, and entire industries which feel like they have no real purpose. But is this true, or do we just feel like our jobs don't mean anything? Today, the most common jobs in the U.S. are retail salesperson, cashier, food preparer, and office clerk. Those involved in the first three are often employed by major firms like Walmart and McDonald's, where it can often feel like you're just an insignificant drone serving a higher power. This contrasts with the most common jobs of the 1950s, where many still worked in retail and food, but they did so for small businesses where they knew their bosses and where a noticeable impact could be made locally. The gap between provider and consumer is bigger than it ever has been, so this partially explains why some people lack job satisfaction. Another reason could be that manual labor formed a big part of many jobs back in the 20th century, and there's nothing like lifting a lot of heavy stuff to make you feel like you've put in a hard day's work. When your back is breaking and your fingers are bloody, you're less likely to question the worth of your labor. Whereas today, the worst an office worker will ever encounter is poor posture and a severe case of butt blisters. But regardless of how we feel about our jobs, is there an argument that what many of us do is objectively without merit? Graeber thinks so, suggesting that humans are kept in work by the 1% as it gives us less time to think about how exploited we really are. Luckily, we'll soon have quite a lot of time in our hands to contemplate our own worthlessness, thanks to the rise of automation. Automation. When you consider the impact of automation, you probably think of factory workers, farmhands, and truck drivers as most likely to be affected. These are all mostly manual jobs that an automated system can do quicker and better than human beings. And major companies around the world are starting to realize that. A recent Amazon expose shed light on just how overworked their packing staff are which makes me feel real bad with all those sex toys and fancy soaps I purchase on a weekly basis. But this situation won't last for long, as Amazon continues to replace human workers with robots at an alarming rate. Some machines can even work 500 times faster than a single human person, and this efficiency disparity between robots and people does not apply solely to blue-collar jobs. The former president of Google China believes that white-collar jobs will actually be the first to fall to the rise of the robots, with positions in data analysis and processing far easier to replace than those which require hand-eye coordination. Even highly educated professions, like that of a doctor, may be under threat in the long term, with artificially intelligent medical systems able to process relevant information about a patient and conduct scans and tests more efficiently than their human counterparts. Some believe that the imposition of automated, artificially intelligent doctors upon the medical industry can reduce the role of doctors to that of a simple service provider, with their future tasks consisting of nothing more than delivering information, practicing their handwriting, 
and ruffling the hair of sickly young lads. Robots will also intrude on the creative industries too, with examples from fashion, music, and journalism proving that machines can be programmed by humans to do easily what other humans labor to do. Oxford University scholars have predicted that 47% of all American jobs and 54% of European roles are at risk of being taken by machines. And this won't happen in 100 years, nor in 50. The employment revolution is happening now, with half of all humans in danger of losing their jobs within the next 20 years. In the near future, human workers may become obsolete. So what then? How do we occupy our days when the robots slave for us in lieu? The solution. If you won the lottery tomorrow, what would you do with your life? Would you travel the world? Would you create great works of art? Or would you descend into a hedonistic stupor of pleasure and self-indulgence? I know what I'd do. I'd purchase the employers of my most hated enemies and hire narcissistic middle managers to slowly deconstruct their self-worth. Oh, and I'd buy a pony. I'd name him Clarence. Clarence the Pony. I'd brush his hair every day. According to some proponents of universal income, this is the life which awaits humanity once the shackles of employment are broken off by the forthcoming hammer of automation. When robots have taken our jobs, humans will all receive a monthly cash award to compensate, with this money freeing us from the burden of work and allowing us to spend our days as we see fit. Opponents claim that UBI is nothing more than a pipe dream, with the prospect of free money for nothing completely incompatible with our modern capitalist society. But despite concerns over how we'd ever pay for such a scheme, trials of universal income are currently underway in a number of nations, with big boy business jerks like Richard Branson and eBay founder Pierre Omodiar among those who back this system. Of course they do. Big business stands to profit most from universal income, as with humans out of the way, they will gain access to a relentless workforce that does not tire form unions, or engage in unsanitary hijinks at the office party. Have you ever seen a robot photocopy its buttocks and make out with Carol from HR in the supply closet? If you have, please send me pictures. The problem is, not everyone wants universal income, despite the apparent benefits of a life without work. The stigma surrounding welfare accounts for some of the ill feeling towards UBI. With our inability to imagine how this utopian economic environment would work, causing many to dismiss it as an unworkable fantasy concocted by idle layabouts and work-shy hippies. Our inherent need for purpose in our daily lives may also explain why some are reluctant to accept the idea of a world without employment. But the truth is, universal basic income is highly unlikely to replace work altogether. All it will mean is that we may end up working much shorter hours something we've been pushing towards for over a century. Ever-progressive Sweden is about to switch to a six-hour workday, and a 2014 poll by YouGov found that 57% of British people supported the introduction of a four-day working week. The average number of weekly work hours has been falling in many countries for more than 100 years, with Mexicans topping the list of yearly work hours in a recent statistical survey conducted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Kind of puts that lazy Mexican stereotype to rest, doesn't it, America? With your pitiful 1,783 hours per year. Mexico should build a wall to keep your bone idle asses out of there, because it sure as hell looks like you lazy schmoes are ever going to build one. However, the reduction of average work hours is not something to be scoffed at. It is actually a sign of wealth and productivity. A century ago, 60 to 70 hour working weeks were common in countries around the world. But today, the average is around 30 to 40 hours per week. Just look at this graph and the comparison between the France of 1870 and the France of today. French men and women worked 66.1 hours a week back in the 19th century, whereas in 2000, they were putting in 35 hours. According to OECD data, the French work 28 hours per week today. That's a 42% decrease, which leaves much more time for surrendering, sitting elegantly, and deciding which horrible parts of animals to eat. As countries reduce the number of hours their citizens work, 
their prosperity and productivity increases massively. Universal basic income, automation, and technological progress seem likely to continue this trend, with the world of work looking like it will change massively over the next two decades as a result. And we're going to explore how this will affect you in our bonus video, The Future of Work, where, amongst other things, we'll investigate which jobs are future-proof and how many hours you can expect to work by the year 2030, which you can watch on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash strange mysteries. For a $2 a month pledge, which you can cancel at any time, you'll get to watch this and all of our bonus content, which goes deeper and darker into every topic than YouTube allows. If you don't want to donate, then that's bullshit. We know you wanted more. Strange mysteries on YouTube and our Patreon bonus videos weren't enough to quench your search for truth, to give you that sense of awe and wonder again, to go past what you thought was the end, to give you the answers you seek, but which only lead to more questions. That's why we just up the stakes. Chemicals of reality. Reality, consciousness, brains. What else is there? Ask yourself that question. Perhaps that's all there really is, but perhaps everything else is found within a place where these ideas, these things, overlap. Some thing, some place that is undefinable. To many people, altering certain chemicals in their brains produces what they would simply call hallucinations. In fact, what we're going to discuss specifically used to be called the businessman's trip, as one could enjoy it. Come down and put your pants back on in the time it takes to eat lunch. It wasn't taken seriously. Well, unless, of course, you started digging. And some people, including us, did. Already, though, to many people, this chemical is special amongst others. Very special. To them, it represents something more meaningful and incredible, as if it's the gateway to the next level of consciousness. The ticket to a higher reality barely explored by most humans. It is the entry point to a new reality, visited by only a select few whose minds have become enlightened through the use of this exotic substance. For this reason, it's commonly referred to as the spirit molecule. But is its reputation as a mystical mind opener deserved? Or is it and everything it represents just a load of bullshit? We look at, investigate, and dive deeply into nearly all available research regarding this question from nearly every angle feasible. And in the course of doing so, stumble upon unexplainable patterns, correlations, and neurological evidence for a reality existing beyond this one. Watch this hour-long Strange Mysteries premium video, Chemicals of Reality, as well as many more to come by becoming an elite premium member of our Patreon at patreon.com slash strange mysteries.